This is Classy Bon on the west coast of Ireland. You may ask yourself, why is a remote castle on the Atlantic fringes in the opening scene of a film concerned with matters relating to the dark heart of aristocratic Central Europe? For Classy Bon is no ordinary Gothic monolith of the aristocrats. It was the former blood sports lodge of none other than His Serene Highness of the Grand Duchy of Hesse, Prince Louis Francis Albert Victor Nicholas of Battenberg, otherwise known as Earl Louis Mountbatten, the late cousin of the present Queen Elizabeth. When Mountbatten was not playing games with the lives of British and Canadian servicemen during the Second World War by sending them on futile suicide missions or causing the death of millions of Hindu Sikhs and Muslims with the partition of India, nor indeed attempting to overthrow a democratically elected British government in order to establish himself as the imperial Kaiser of the British Empire, Mountbatten partook in the raping of teenage boys, abducted by a network of orange lodges and Freemasons from the Kinkora Boys' Home in Belfast, and which were taken very often on a one-way journey to his blood sports lodge here in County Sligo. Mountbatten, the mentor of the current Prince of Wales, was not human in the way the rest of us are. The Romano-Prussian aristocratic DNA within his being was far from unusual, with the exception of the murdered Princess Diana, an aristocratic anomaly in that she was born with a sense of innate compassion and decency. They are all infected by the same consciousness parasite which their bloodline has carried from Babylon to Buckingham Palace. While the Spencer family have long provided sexual comfort and breeding units for the Romano-Prussian aristocrats currently residing on the British crown, a grave error was made with Diana Spencer, which had to be corrected, and indeed was, in an underpass in Paris when her womb became surplus to the royal breeding stock. Sexual and vicious trauma inflicted upon commoner children and wretched women is the ultimate blood sport of the Romano-Prussian aristocrats and their agents continue to supply them with fresh meat to this very day. It is said that history is a monument built upon the glorious dreams of men. Rarely is it ever spoken that history is more likely to be built upon the psychedelic visions and waking terrors of powerful monsters. On the 25th of February, 1947, the victorious Allied Control Council formally proclaimed the dissolution of Prussia, placing much of the blame for World War II on the legacy of Prussian militarism and bureaucracy as the initial inspiration for the creation of, and also, the territorial objectives of the Third Reich. However, there were other reasons for the Allies so effectively wiping Prussia off the map and out of the consciousness of Western ideology. The United States was in many ways the bastard offspring of Prussian ideology, especially the American education model. The British aristocracy had spent the better part of the previous 200 years attempting to interbreed with Prussian nobility, while the French and Russians both had a historical vendetta of their own to settle with the Prussians. 
to the elite and upper social echelons of the Allied powers, Prussia was viewed as a dark family secret and the defeat of the Third Reich finally gave them the opportunity to bury it once and for all. Doing so not only allowed them to smother Prussia's dark secrets, but also the dark secrets of their own. For everything the Western elite hold dear to this day, the use of education to mind control the masses, absolute servitude to the state, and along with rampant imperialism and military expansion, were all inspired by the creation of and the history of modern Prussia. The focal point of this legacy was the greatest Prussian leader, Frederick II, or as he was commonly known, Frederick the Great. As the Soviets removed his statue from its plinth in Berlin, they knew precisely what the symbolism of their actions were. For the personality cult which grew up around Frederick the Great was Germany and the eternal paradox of the German soul. A paradox created by a powerful psychedelic experience which Frederick underwent as a young man while in prison and one also very similar to that experienced by Adolf Hitler upon hearing of Germany's surrender in 1919. This is why on Valpurgis night 1945 the only portrait hanging inside Hitler's Berlin bunker 16 meters under the ferocious bombardment of the Red Army's heavy artillery was that of Frederick the Great whom Hitler was attempting to channel while hoping to invoke the miraculous powers of his Prussian hero king to kill the Allied leadership with a psychic attack. For never is German leadership and aristocracy far from the occult forces. And by extension, neither are the British aristocrats who carry Prussian blood in many of their veins. A consanguous conduit of dark occult infatuation which they practice inside their stately homes to this day. For what infected Frederick the Great inside his prison cell is carried in the bloodlines from generation to generation through the inbreeding of noble blood. This is that little cold story, a story which comes from Prussia. Who are these people? Who are they really? Who do they represent? Why this lack of compassion? Why this, these decades of cruelty? And why are they all Germans? You all know that the, the Queen's family is not Windsor. They changed, yeah, I know you're all not. They changed their names in 1914 to sound more English. But they were all speaking German in Buckingham Palace. It just sounded more, it sounded more British. Now, we never hear about Prussia. We, we never hear about this, this state in northern Germany that existed until about the 1870s. We, we don't hear much about it. We don't hear what this place was, where it came from, how it developed and what its lasting influence on the world was. Prussia basically extended from the, the Baltic republics around where Lithuania, Latvia, those, Estonia, those kinds of places, along the Baltic Sea, across northern Poland area, into northern Germany, and up a little bit into Denmark, and down south, not quite as far as Bavaria, but a good chunk and then also a bit of Holland. So it just goes to show you, this was a huge, a quite a huge geographic area in, ter in European terms. It probably was about the same size as modern United Germany, except it was flipped kind of up right, sideways rather than north-south. But geographically, in terms of uh, physical landmass, it wasn't there. Uh, it wasn't there. Uh, it wasn't small, it was huge. Now, Prussia, was, was a different kind of Germany than the rest of the German states. At that time, up until, you'd be quite surprised, up until the, 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 the creation of the German Empire under Bismarck, there was probably about 11 to 1,200 German countries in, in that area, Germans, big duchies, principalities, but a vast amount of them. And there, were, there was, you know, Saxony, there's loads of them. There were Bavaria and there's tons of small ones that were, were spread all across into, because of various conflicts in history had spread across that area. Now, the Prussians, like the Germans, uh, like when I was, was researching for Valpurgis night, I came to be very sympathetic to the German people. 
because I see the German people have been changed. If you look at the Germans prior to what the Prussians changed with them, they were just like the Anglo-Saxons or the Celts or the Vikings. They were kind of a wild people and they had a very rich, deep, magical culture. And that's not something you associate with Germans at all. The Prussian royal families and the Prussian aristocrats changed that. And they changed it in a way that is incredibly significant. I'll talk about it later. But they basically did it in terms of education and language. They, changed, they were the first ones to understand that words actually have power. They actually have real power on, on human consciousness. Now, it's called magic. That's what magic really is. They, my, you know, my will imposed on you and you conforming with my will. That's all magic is. I don't have to go spell you, I don't have to wear a funny hat. But if I can convince you that I'm right and you're wrong, that's magic, that's all it is, okay? But that also works at a social level. Now, that's Prussia. And that is a country that has left such a mark on history and yet no one really knows about it. Even to this day, Prussia is a land that's its culture and its ethos and its social and its administrative structures control basically the European Union. The European Union operates really on the Prussian aristocratic models. In fact, and when Adolf Hitler and the National Socialists got into power, they, uh, after all the, this platform of government they said they'd introduce, which they did, Hitler, after a couple of weeks, then basically said, oh, we'll check, we'll just, it's okay, it's going to be fine, we're going to run it along Prussian aristocratic lines. So the Prussian aristocrats remain in power even when the National Socialists were in power. And one of the reasons that becomes very apparent is the assassinations on Adolf Hitler towards the end of his reign, because they were all organized by Prussian aristocrats who were worried that the communists were going to take their castles off them. That's the only reason they got involved in a... They didn't care about German soldiers, you know, freezing to death in the Eastern Front. They only did it because they wanted to look after their stuff. Now, I have a film that I'm making at the moment called From Prussia with Blood to try and it'll be a more professional version of what's happening today. But Prussian aristocratic legal rights, nearly up until the 20th century, they had the right of corporal punishment. And this is an actual etching describing uh, legal, showing legally what the Prussian aristocrat can do. And you see he's whipping a guy and it can, he can kill him. No problem, he can kill him and get away with it. Because he's not considered, the Prussian, ordinary Prussian was not considered any more important than a farm animal. In fact, he's lower than the dog. See how the dog is? The dog's no problem. This poor bastard here is being about to be whipped to death. And this was what it was like, ferocious cruelty. The Prussians took the German peasantry the Prussian peasantry, and they literally put them through a kind of a, a trauma-based mind control program on a massive level. If you know anything about like military uh, or secret services, mind control programs, they're based on trauma. That's you know what's happening. They're traumatizing people. That's it. You can change a person into something called dissociative, a dissociative identity disorder, which is what really, really does is you're so horrified by what's being done to you, you create a partition in your brain where you escape. And then through the trauma, they put you in that partition in your brain. And what they do is they seek later on to open you back up again, so they can put ideas, it's almost like a, a, a stored piece of a hardware, a software in your brain. This is what happens to Han Sirhan, where the guy who shot Robert Kennedy, the guy who never, he had spent time in a, in a psychiatric place, and they had done, the MK Ultra thing had been done on him and other people, and then he was given the order out of blue, and he had no idea why he did what he did. So they were doing it to a nation. They were doing it to a nation. And where did this come from? Where is this lack of decency? Where, what, what makes aristocrats believe they can do this? You know, where they, they, they're human beings just like us. There is an element of, yeah, monotheism, like I was here last time I spoke about monotheism, that the divine right of kings. But what does that mean really? What makes them believe they're, they're more godlike? Okay. Now we're getting into kind of spooky stuff, but this is important stuff. 
Where did Prussia come from? Prussia came from a military religious order called the Teutonic Knights, who were established in the Middle East during the Crusades to fight the Muslims. And uh, they still exist to this day. They're still, they're still around. And like the Crusaders, like all the Templars and all the other ones, they became incredibly powerful and incredibly rich, but they also became infused with the culture of the region. In fact, there's almost a thing like you will destroy the idea, you will destroy what you become, you destroy the thing, I think it was Carl Jung who said, be careful not to spend too much time looking into hell or you will find hell looking back at you. Well, these people, just like the Templars had this, you know, the stories of the Templars had discovered the idea of, they found the, these massive jewels under the temple and all these other stories. Again, this is one of the, this stuff is not really well known in the English speaking world, and this is what I find so interesting, is that there's a, I'm not going to say it's true, but the, the Islamic spiritual tradition has this idea of a thing called the jinn. It's uh, basically a demon or something from, that they call from smokeless fire, which suggests plasma or something like that. I'm not saying this is a demon, literally. I'm talking about a corruption of consciousness here. An infection, okay? And these guys, if you look at European royalty prior to this, you didn't really have the same idea of aristocrats being more godly than the people. In fact, in many instances, they fought alongside with their people. You know, Harold at the at the, the Battle of Hastings, etc. All through history, up until that point, the, often the king was on the field with the lads at the front. Doesn't matter if they were Anglo-Saxons, Saxons, Gaels, Picts, Vikings. He was nearly always there, and he was he was willing to die alongside them. That stopped when these guys came back from the Middle East, and you suddenly had very different kind of kingdoms established. What they did was basically bring this kind of infection of the consciousness that already existed in the Middle East through this Abrahamic idea, this, uh, which really spills out of Babylon. This idea of there's an elite class that are up here and they're so different compared to what's down here. They're like gods. And in the in Middle Eastern world, they'd often say those people are infected by the jinn. That to them, the, met, the allegory and metaphor they use will be a demon that's inside them. That's not a human being that hates human beings and they're infected. In fact, in my first book, Puzzling People, I, I show an example of a royal family in Oman. And I'm sorry, is it Oman? It's one of the Arab oil states in the Gulf where the actual royal family boasts about being descendants of the jinn. They don't hide it, they boast about it. And this is a wealthy Arab oil republic where something like 45% of the children are actually at starvation level. Even though they're fabulously wealthy with oil, they're all spending on palaces for themselves. And this is what these guys brought back from the Middle East. This, this infection, they brought it back. And when they landed in Europe, these guys basically started, they portray themselves as godly and kingly and noble and all. You know, we're, the, we're the lads, you know, we're the ones. But they are basically taking over countries like Sumon Robin land. And the people who lived there were, all, were just as much livestock as the animals that lived there. And here's Frederick the Great. I love that, the, the Great. See, this is when this all started. 8, 11, 94, 1250, invasion of Prussia and the consolidation of what I call the aristocratic infection the Middle Eastern infection had come into Europe. And suddenly the aristocrats were very different than they had been. So it was in here now, Europe was different. And Prussia was where this all really started to consolidate. But it kept going, it kept showing up everywhere. And this is where the lack of compassion, the lack of cruelty came out, this is like Prospero, in the masquerade of the Red Death, the Edgar Allan Poe play, short story, I'm sorry. This complete incon I don't care if the peasants are starving, I don't care. I'm the Tsar, I'm a king, I'm an emperor. We're the aristocrats, 
we go to different schools, we're just different and we inbreed. Why do we inbreed? Why are we so caught up in making sure we don't marry outside the bloodline to keep the infection going? Now, this is, this is, you know, this, this, this stuff has led me down some amazing roads and uh, I'm not a big fan of the psychedelic stuff. Uh, I'll tell you why. It's often sold, sold as something amazing, but it, they never tell you about the bad side of it. You know, and it can go horrifically wrong. There's bad psychedelic trips and there's good psychedelic trips. But it, you're rolling a dice, you know, that kind of thing. But there's oh, there seems to be a growing assumption now that it's like, Oh, it's just everyone should drink ayahuasca and we'll all be perfect and everything like that. I mean, that to me is just like a scary kind of idea they're putting into people's heads now because it's, it's too much like Huxley's Brave New World and that we should, instead of like worrying about things or challenging the government or standing up for our rights and not paying our taxes, we should, you know, take some, some entheogen, entheogens and, and just float off into magic land and everything will be okay because our governments will make sure that our best interests are served while we're off tripping. There's a lot of that going on now, I don't like it. Okay, this guy here, this is, this is an amazing story. There's almost like antibodies that appear now and again within this kind of Prussian, Romano, what are you going to call it? Babylon bloodline. It shows up now and again. And I think Diana Spencer was one of them, where they're born with an innate decency and kindness, and it just radiates off them. It just radiates off them. There was a guy called Frederick II of Prussia, and he was born to Frederick the First. His father was an authoritarian, hard-assed, you know, Prussian emperor, this kind of thing. And this guy was quite different. And this is a very, this is a occurring theme that can, seems to happen in this history. You have, you have someone called, an individual called, later on, that came on later on called Caspar Hauser, who was just like this, uh, this, this homeless child that appeared in the streets of Baden one day, and he claimed to be from the house of, the Royal House of, of, of Baden, I think it was, yeah. And he, sorry, he showed in Nuremberg on Valpurgis on April 30, but that's a whole other story. Uh, no, he claimed to be born then, sorry. And uh, he, he had the same effect. It was just this gentle child, a soul that radiated like this magical child. And Frederick II of Germany, when he, of Prussia, sorry, when he was born, he was different than the rest of them. He was artistic, he was liked, he was kind, and he was not really, though he was highly educated and he went to the military schools and everything, he was not like the rest of them. He was almost like their their freak, you know that kind of a thing? Like a normal family has a psychopath born every so often, these have the other problem. Every so often some, someone normal is born. But uh, this guy became involved in a gay relationship with a guy called uh, Hans Hermann von Katte, who was like another aristocrat who was like a decent, I, think he, I don't think he was like a major aristocrat. And uh, the two of them had planned to run away to England in a kind of a lover's a low kind of thing. They weren't openly gay, but you know, you can tell us, you can kind of understand, you kind of get the idea of what was happening. They were arrested, and uh, the father, the father Frederick the First, accused them of going to England to recruit money and troops of uh, George the Third here to invade Prussia and begin a revolution because there was a big fear of revolutions at that time building up leading towards the French Revolution, that there was growth in the Enlightenment was making more people educated, and so on. So what happened to this poor guy was, if the two guys, the father couldn't send, unfortunately he said, couldn't sentence his own son to death for being a nice guy, uh, under the tenets of the Holy Roman Empire, where a king can't kill the, the eldest son. So he had to deal with him. So he put him in the prison and forced him to watch Van Katta's beheading. Now, isn't it funny that, like, we're all coming full circle, what we're bombarded with in the news lately? Okay, there's something about beheading that has a psychedelic effect, a bad one. It causes a kind of a fracturing of the cognitive processing, 
and it causes people to have a very strong... I know I can't watch those videos that when you see them running on Facebook and think, I can't watch them. I don't even like the photo. I don't even like thinking about it. But this is something they've known for a long time. This is why the Bourbons and they have the, the executions by, in uh, France during the revolution, the guillotine was in public. And if you read some of the accounts of what happened during these executions, they were like rock concerts and people in the states of hysterics. They would run over and try to get the blood of the person that was killed because they believed that the blood of a person who had been decapitated had a magical power. And it would often be like in states of trance and uh, euphoric states. It would trigger a psychedelic state. And I kind of see that when I observe on Facebook, there seems to be a fetish for posting all these beheading things. And you can almost see these people become fanboys of it. Why? And like, you've lost the run of yourself here. This is not, this is bizarre. Even if it's not real and ISIS are not real, this is just a very weird thing to be obsessed with. And uh, so anyway, Frederick II had to witness this poor guy. You can see this is, a, this is an actual contemporary drawing of the time. That's how it happened. And he's begging to us, oh, I miss you. I can't live without you, blah, 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 blah. From Cather down there, he's, he, he's decapitated in front of him. And then something really creepy happens. Frederick falls into a trance, a psychedelic, a psychedelic trance. Where he's and this this is just shows up all through history. This I, this leader or this religious leader who has a psychedelic experience and then comes out as somebody else. And this is what happened to him. And he during during this, this descriptions of his psychedelic experience in the in the in the in the, in the prison cell, he's talked about seeing his the ghost, the ghost of him, demons, all these kinds of things. And then he has other visions of what's going to happen with Germany in the future. <laughs> within Prussia that spread throughout Germany of ed 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 everything from agriculture, new forms of military warfare, uh, education as I said, and many other things, diplomacy, industry, all as a result of this psychedelic, this negative psychedelic experience he had. It was almost like he'd been corrected in their minds. He was back to being evil, you know? And, he, and it was. In, there was a... Uh, 
He won tremendous victories against the Austrians and that were incredible military victories. And it changed the Prussian army. It changed even the Prussian military. Now, these people are dark. They don't, like, they don't behave like us. They have, they, when we see royal pageants, we have to remind ourselves that they're not pageants, they're rituals. They're a ritual of a kind of a, no, a, a nobility cult. That's the way you have to look at them. They're rituals, okay? And I found this in a German book recently, and it's showing a, I think it's the Treaty of Malmo, a peace treaty that's celebrated by these intellectuals and aristocrats symbolically burying the body of a 71-year-old child. I mean, who comes up with this? You know, like, because you imagine, like, see here at New Horizons, if you suddenly won an award, that's celebrated by having a little ritual where we bury a baby. Yeah, you know, this is how they behave. And these are the people who rule us. This is how weird they are. This is, this is, how, this is how different they are than us. And yet, this was in the height of the Enlightenment. This is around the 1840s, I think, 30s. The height of the Enlightenment, where everything was get rid of, get rid of superstition, get rid of religion, get rid of, you know, all this nonsense. But let's bar, bar, bury symbolically bury a nine-year-old child, celebrate a treaty. This is what we're dealing with. These people are not like us. They're different. And uh, if there's a nine, a nine a, sorry, a seven-month-old baby inside that, I don't know. It's just, it's just weird shit, no matter how you look at it. And this is, again, this is the Prussians. This is how they were. It was very, the Prussian aristocrats now, not the Prussian people. The Prussian people were actually victims, and we'll get to that later. They, they were, they were distorted, they were mad. They were crazy. And yeah, they laid the foundations of the European Union later on, as we'll see. And then you ask yourself, why is the world so crazy? Now, Frederick the Great, 1712 to 1786, he was an enlightened absolutist, an absolute, absolutism, sorry, I've got a terrible call. Basically, the enlightenment is wrong. Science and reason is everything. We must strive for reason. We must strive for common sense and get rid of all the superstition. And as long as you do as the king tells you. So it was the king was the ultimate authority of what reason was. What did the king said? was the truth. Now his family, this, 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 is, this is the origin now of the British Royal Sudan. They emerged from Franconia. Franconia is kind of on the border of Upper Bavaria. This is where they came from. As I said, they founded the Kingdom of Prussia after basically the origin of the Teutonic Knights who returned, I believe, from the Middle East with this kind of, psych this kind of psychic infection. And they've infected, and I, have make no, I, I make no apology for using that term, all European royalty since, for the simple reason that they've been obsessed with inbreeding, they're obsessed with it. Now, the Prussian military were, had been so badly treated, and you're talking about a people who've been so downtrodden, and it's the, Prus the regular Prussian people, who I like, showed you the photograph earlier on, where the aristocrat could beat them to death if he felt like it, that in the Prussian army at that time, as this, era, this, this period was developing, a Prussian infantryman was more likely to be murdered by a Prussian officer than he was by the enemy. That was, they, they were just killing, you know, oh, your battalion messed up, hang them all, this kind of thing. And this, uh, this, this kind of dark cruelty kind of spread within the, the military orders there. And that's where you get the Hessian guards. They were the, basically the Rothschild private army coming out of the princes, the, the, the princes of Frankfurt, again German. And uh, the, the Hessian guards had that same viciousness that was unheard of in the American fighting on the side of the British, even though they were German mercenaries. They weren't actually British, but they were fighting on the side of the British they used uh, the, the acts of cruelty towards the American prisoners were heard of, they would kill everybody. Uh, they captured them. They were also heavily involved in the 1798 Irish Rebellion. And uh, when, the, when the United Irishmen lost, and the British and the Hessians won, they would have competitions such as hanging people, how many you could hang. 
and they had human gallows who would lift up two prisoners like this, big six foot fellas, and that's the kind of thing that, this is not normal behaviour, this is what I'm trying to say to you, this is how dark it is. And I'm sorry to hit you with this, I know it sounds very negative now, but we will get somewhere better, but I'm just going to show you that, you know, it's just, it's just like the whole thing. You, you know, Carl Jung says, we don't make, we don't imagine beings of light by looking at airy fairy things, but by making the darkness conscious. And then when you know when the darkness is conscious, then you know where the good stuff is that you can help you. Same reason with the psychopath stuff. If you know who's a psychopath in your job, if it's your boss, you know how to avoid them and get with the decent people. So